better looking, smarter part of the Reynolds family band, and wiser, and we could go on for a long time with that one. And, uh, and your banjo player, I'm thinking power forward in the NBA. <laughs> you give LeBron a run for his money. So we've been talking about the past couple of weeks that we have an enemy who's out to kill, steal, and destroy, to mess up our lives. And the way Jesus describes him is as a liar. Every time he speaks, he's a, it's a lie. In fact, the Bible has another description of him, and it's called the angel of light, that, that he appears or, or, or comes across sometimes as an angel of light. What that means is, rather than giving you an out-and-out 100% lie, he will come and give you something that has 60, 70, 80, even 90% truth in it. And if you choose to live your life based on that, it will mess you up. In fact, there are a lot of times in the Bible where they came across something that looked, I mean, almost looked completely right, just a little bit, maybe even just a 3 or 4% lie in it. But people bought into that, and boy, did it mess them up. So, we live in a world that's full of lies. We've been looking at some of those, and ones that we looked at a couple weeks ago was, you'll never be good enough. You'll never change. You don't have what it takes. We looked at the, the lie that you can fix it yourself. You don't need anybody's help. You don't need God. You don't need others. You can do it yourself. Last week and this week, we're looking at the same lie because it's so prevalent in our culture, and that's the lie of this, that God wants you happy, or the secular version of this is, you deserve to be happy. See, our culture is obsessed with happiness. Our culture thinks everything they buy, everything that they are part of, ought to come with a can of happiness. The stories change, but the de or the details change, but the stories are somewhat the same. They go kind of like this. I've been married for 24 years. My husband has never been interested in, in the family or, or me for the most part. And 24 years is a long time to be unhappy. Before I got married, I had a boyfriend, and I wanted to marry him, but he wasn't ready yet. We met up a couple months ago, and we've been seeing a lot of each other. I believe God has brought him back into my life. And I know you're going to tell me it's wrong, but I believe I deserve to be happy, or I believe God wants me to be happy. Now, before you come down on that, every one of us here has at some point chosen to do what we thought would make us happy other than what we knew God wanted us to do. Thinking that if we just did this, if we spent our lives and went after this thing, whatever it may be, that that would make us happy. And what it wound up doing is making us totally miserable. Think of it this way. Eve didn't take a bite of the, the piece of fruit thinking, this is going to make my life miserable. She took a bite of that fruit thinking, this is going to make me happy. Cain thought killing Abel would make him happy. Esau thought drinking some of that soup would make him happy. Noah thought getting drunk would make him happy. Joseph's brothers thought selling Joseph into slavery would make, him, would make them happy. Samson thought marrying that Philistine woman would make him happy. David thought sleeping with another man's wife would make him happy. Amnon thought lusting after his half-sister Tamar would make him happy. Solomon thought, I have 999 women in my life. Surely one more will make me happy. <laughs> Rich young ruler thought keeping my wealth will make me happy. Judas thought 30 pieces of silver would make him happy. And Nas and Sapphira thought selling their money for this amount and lying to God about it would make them happy. Chances are you think that sleeping with that person or, or doing a certain thing in your life will make you happy. But we live in a time when even secular sociologists and, and, and the stats and all the stories tell us that when a person pursues after happiness, and they make that pursuit, they don't get happy. They get miserable in, instead. It's called the pleasure paradox or the happiness illusion. The idea 
that when somebody makes their goal in life to be happy, they wind up miserable. Happiness becomes very elusive to them. And here are some of the, the lies about that. Number one, happiness is found by pursuing pleasure. Some people think that'll make him happy. Solomon tried this. Solomon spent years of his life saying, I'm going to see if pursuing pleasure will make me happy. And he had the means to do it. Anything pleasurable he could think of, he had the means to be able to carry that out, to, to live out that lifestyle, whatever it was. He had the means to do it. But in the end, what did he say? He said it was all emptiness, vanity, like chasing the wind. And there are some of you. You got out of high school, you got out of college, you thought, I'm not very happy. I need to pursue after pleasure. Maybe that'll make me happy. And so you did that for several years. Then maybe in your late 20s or 30s or 40s, or 50s, or if you're especially hard-headed in your 60s, you come to realize this isn't working for me. You thought that pleasure, pursuing after pleasure would make you happy. But it didn't end up that way. It doesn't work that way. The second thing, happiness is determined by our circumstances. That's what a lot of people think. They get the idea of the if onlys. If only I had more money. If only I had a better job. If only I had a nicer car. If only I had a better body. If only I had a better appearance, I'd be happy. Well, if that was the case, that if only my circumstances improved, I'd be happy, our country would be the happiest people in the world, in the history of the world. Because of the way, as a culture, our circumstances have improved over the past few years. But America ranks 33rd on the happy in the scale. That we're the 33rd happiest nation in the world. And we have depression everywhere. In fact, if you were born after 1945, you're 10 times more likely to be depressed than those born earlier. And you would think, but life is so much easier than it was back then. We have so much more stuff. It's a lot more comfortable. It doesn't make sense why we shouldn't be happier. But you know, I don't have to tell you, depression has skyrocketed. Suicides have skyrocketed. Talked to a pastor friend this week. He said he's had three funerals over the past couple weeks. Two of them were suicides. One a young man's early 20s, one a woman in her early 40s. We think if only, if only my circumstances would change, I would be happy. But some of you, you know that's not true. Because you said earlier in your life, if only I made that much money, I'd be happy. And now you do make that much money and you're miserable. Some of you are single. If only I was married, I'd be happy. Now you're married, you say, I wish I was single. I wouldn't have laughed at that if I were you. <laughs> Not smart. Whatever position we find ourselves in, we think if only my circumstances would change, then I would be happy. But happiness is not based on circumstances, it's not based on pleasure. It's based on the presence of God in our life. Here's how Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 4. He says, I know both how to make do with little and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. What's he saying? Paul is saying, my happiness is not found in my contentment. My happiness is not found in my circumstances. My circumstances could be good, could be bad, could be rich, could be poor. My contentment, my happiness is not based on my circumstances. It's not based on what's going on around me. It's based on what Christ is doing in me. Jesus says the same thing to his disciples in John chapter 16. He knows he's, he's got a few hours before the crucifixion takes place. And he knows that the disciples are going to be devastated by this, that they're, that they're going to be broken but he also knows he's going to resurrect, he's going to ascend, and when he leaves, what's going to happen in? They're going to be persecuted. They're going to be tortured at times even for their faith. But this is what he tells them in, in John 16, 22. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy from you. 
Nothing's going to touch that joy. There's no circumstances that's going to touch that joy. It's not going to be dependent upon circumstances around you. Nothing can happen that's going to take your joy away. Why? Because it's, it's found in your relationship with me. So the enemy wants you to believe that your happiness is based on what's going on around you. That if you can just change your circumstances, you'll be happy. But you know that, right? You know that your circumstances, they change it. That's not going to bring happiness, right? You realize that? The appropriate answer is yes, pastor, we realize that. But then how come we spend so much of our lives living like it does? How come you leave here today and you'll go home and you think your happiness is dependent upon circumstances? So, the third thing we think, we think I'll be happy by focusing on myself. I'll just be the center of my world. That'll make me happy. There was an article in the Los Angeles Times and anyway, without my glasses, we'll try this. <laughs> the title of it was Studies Find Depression, That There's Depression Epidemic Among Young Adults. And the story tells how young adults have, it's the same stat I quoted earlier, they have a 10 times more likely to be depressed than their grandparents. So the same stat I told you earlier, just reading it differently. But the thing is, this article mentions why they're so depressed. And, and this is what the article says. It's so depressed is because they think today that when they're depressed, that social media is telling them and, and all the commercials are telling them they need to focus on their own happiness. And then they say, because we know now, because like I said earlier, they know in our culture, all the, the stat people, all the sociologists, they know that when you pursue after your own happiness, that's the worst thing you can do. That's going to just lead you into further unhappiness. But that's what our culture is telling people in the middle of their depression. Just focus on yourself. How many of you have ever been to a bar at happy hour? Maybe that's not the question to ask at church. Let me try it again. <laughs> How many of you have ever been seated next to a bar during happy hour? Let's try that one, okay? Because you go and you watch and you think, these people, you're going to happy hour. They should be happy. They should be singing. It's happy hour. But you'll find some of the most miserable people at happy hour because their focus is still on themselves. What can they do to, to make themselves happy? So when I say that God wants you to be happy is a lie, does that mean God wants you to be miserable? Does that mean God's favorite song is, if you're happy and you know it, repent? No. No. God wants you to be happy. He just doesn't have the goal of his life, goal of his being to make you happy. When you get up in the morning, God doesn't say, oh, what can I do to, to give them a happy day today? Have you ever heard a pastor say, God doesn't want you happy, he wants you holy? As if those two things are pitted against each other. You have a choice. Do you want to be happy or do you want to be holy? But the Bible teaches that holiness is fueled by happiness. This is what David teaches us in Psalm chapter 1. Happy is the man who does not sit with the wicked, walk with the wicked, who doesn't do what the wicked do, the wicked do and, and go the way of the wicked. But the person who bases their life on the truths of God they're like a tree that's planted by the water, always producing fruit, always green leaves, and everything they do will succeed. Does God want you happy? Yes. Delight yourself in the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Be glad in the Lord. Happy is the man whose God is the Lord. Rejoice, rejoice always. Or the Beatitudes, happy is the person who, happy is the person who, happy is the person who. Yes, God wants you happy, but he wants your happiness to be fueled by holiness. And he wants your happiness to be fueled by 
the second thing is to be fueled by gratitude. By gratitude. Have you ever seen the, the on, maybe on the internet or something like that, or maybe some of the social media, FWP? You know what FWP stands for? You ever seen that? First world problem. It's like when you come up from the grocery store and you got all these groceries and you open your refrigerator and you got no room to put this stuff in your refrigerator. That's a first world problem. Or when you're irritated because your movie takes so long to download. That's a first world problem. Or you're just so sick and tired of eating in all those restaurants near where you work at. Sounds like a first world problem. Or you get upset because your Apple Watch doesn't keep adequate distance when you're jogging on the beach. Sounds like a first world problem to me. Or when my son calls me up and says, I didn't get first class on my flight. They put me in business class. I go, Sounds like a first world problem to me, son. You know, 25% of Americans with a two-car garage can't park two cars in their garage because they've got so much stuff in them. Sounds like a year problem, right? That's a first world problem. And we have all these first world problems. And what do they do? They, they lead us to be in discontent. They lead us to be ungrateful. There's a study done by Emmons and McCullough. And what they did is they took a group of people and they asked them to keep a gratitude journal. Every day, put in it things that you're thankful for. And this other group of people, they asked them to keep an annoyance journal. Every day, keep track of things that annoy you. And his result, we realize this, it says, those who kept gratitude journals showed markedly greater increases in energy and enthusiasm. They slept better. It's my eyes that are giving me a hard problem here. They slept better and they were significantly less depressed. Well, that's not surprising to us. We realize that. But why was that so? Why? Why would being thankful make such a difference? There's a thing that we read about in the Bible. Wherever we see God in his fullness, in other words, we just see God displayed in all his glory. Sometimes that's in the book of Revelation where we have this vision of God that John has in heaven. Sometimes we see it in the Old Testament where his glory would come and fill the temple. We see it also mentioned in the New Testament where it talks about a person who's full of the Holy Spirit. And whenever you see God in his glory like that, what's going on? Thanksgiving. It's always there. Being in the presence of God it's just going to happen. There's going to be somebody that's going to be giving thanks. And maybe because we don't spend enough time pursuing and living in the presence of God, we're not very grateful people. Therefore, we're not very happy. So happiness is fueled by holiness. Happiness is fueled by gratitude. And happiness is fueled by a focus on others. There was a psychiatrist by the name of, of Martin Siegelman. He wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. This is a guy who made his whole academic career trying to find out what made people happy. And he said, most people, they think that what makes them happy is getting more of something that they like. More chocolate, more sex, more money, more recognition. But he said the problem with that is there's always a gap between more and enough. It never gets filled. You always want more, you never get enough. But then this is what he did. He began asking his students to go and do one act that brought them pleasure one pleasurable act, and then do one act where you focus on others. And what the result of that was, he said that the, the afterglow 
of doing the one pleasurable act, whatever it was, it may have been getting a bowl of ice cream, it may have been going to the movie, it may have been hanging out with friends, but the afterglow of that pleasurable act paled in comparison to the one selfless act of compassion for somebody else. And this is what he wrote. The students who were involved in those selfless acts became less self-absorbed, less depressed. They had a greater sense of community and a decreased sense of loneliness. He talks about when people's primary focus is to make themselves happy, they wind up getting more depressed. But when people begin to focus on others, happiness gets thrown in. It's almost as if we were designed for that. Now, he didn't say that. I added that. So, let's sort of wrap this up. You don't deserve to be happy. You deserve to go to hell. Okay? That's a pleasant thought, isn't it? And if you wake up in the morning thinking, I don't deserve to be happy, you're not going to be very happy. If you wake up in the morning thinking, I deserve to go to hell, eh, not going to be very happy with that either. But if you wake up in the morning going, I deserve to go to hell, but I am saved eternally because of Jesus Christ, that can make you happy. So think of it this way. Suppose you're a billionaire. Okay? This is just pretend, right? You're a billionaire. And you happen to have three $10 $10 bills in your wallet, probably because you're married to a billionaire and they just want to give you a little bit of, I don't know, lots of reasons. But you have three $10 bills in your pocket and you're over in Dallas and you catch a cab and you give the cab a $10 bill for an $8 fare. Later on in the day, you look in your wallet and there's not two $10 bills, there's only one. What happened to the other $10 bill? Did you actually give the cabbie two $10 bills? Did it drop out of your wallet when you handed him a $10 bill? What happened to it? Are you going to spend the rest of the day with a scowl on your face and sort of, you know, a little bit perturbed and and angry that you can't find another $10 bill? What happened to it? Are you going to be all anxious about that $10 bill? No, you're a billionaire. It's just $10. And I know that some things you're going to face this week is going to be pretty overwhelming, and I'm not trying to make light of any of that. But compared to your salvation, it's sort of like a $10 bill. And whenever we as a Christian, we shake our fist at God and we go, I deserve to be happy. That just shows you're not getting it. You're a spiritual billionaire. And you're sitting here making a fuss over something that's like $10. To realize what God has given us. We have a salvation that circumstances can't touch, that nothing can get in the way of. Here's how, we, here's, here's how it's put in, in Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. That's how God wants us to think, because that's reality. That's truth. And you can go and try and spend your life based on the lies that you deserve to be happy and and God's goal in life is to make you happy. Or you can realize what God has done for you already. Your circumstances, they can be all over the place. Pleasure may come, it may go. But what you have in Christ can never be taken away. It can't be touched by Satan. It can't be touched by anything in this world. Why would you want to keep pursuing other things? So don't let pleasure, don't let circumstances, don't let focusing on yourself become what your life is all about. Instead, realize that your happiness is fueled by holiness, is fueled by gratitude, is fueled by focusing on other people. You do that, you discover. Not only something that will change your life, but you'll discover the soul of what God has done, the heart of what God has done in our salvation. 
Now, that's not based on circumstances. It's based on his presence. It's based upon what he does in us. And that will bring about a joy that this world can't touch. Nothing can. So, have you bought into that lie? What are you looking for to fulfill you? What are you trying to base your life upon? Here's the thing. Before you can live by the truth, you have to accept the truth. You have to accept it. Have you accepted the truth? Are you living your life based on the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for you? Or is that just words that you use occasionally, but really you're living for your own pleasure. You're living to try and improve your own circumstances. You're living for your own happiness. You're trying to make yourself the center of your universe. Maybe it's time for some of you to say, I believe there is truth, 100% truth, and I want to live my life based on that. Don't buy into a lie because all it takes is just a little bit, just a little bit of lie, and it will mess your life up. And it's too often we have let those things seep inside the church and infiltrate and slowly disintegrate the very life, the very soul of a church. When we think it's about our pleasure, our circumstances, that's what will make us happy. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. You need to find your happiness based on the presence of God. That's where it needs to be based on. And it needs to be fueled by holiness, by gratitude, and by a focus on others. So we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Yep, that's my signal. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation.